Let's jump to pride because I think that this is an interesting one. Again, for women to hear specifically, I think that we're often taught that we are not good enough, not pretty enough, not worthy enough, not capable. It's like always, we need to always, there's this, always this moving target that we are trying to hit. And we often, whether it's an internally motivated or externally directed voice that's telling us you're not enough yet. If you just do this and then you do that, and it's like, well, now that you've done this, you can now here's the next step. So how can we challenge some of these negative thoughts? So I love the contrast between guilt and shame. So if we're having shame, how can we contrast that belief system that that's that's leading to some of these behaviors these you know maladaptive maybe behaviors and then and then develop a sense of self-compassion so that we can start to de- develop that pride or that intrinsic sense of self-worth i think the first thing is even just being aware that there is a construct uh, in society that wants us to feel this way right because whether it's consumer culture it benefits somebody for women to think poorly of themselves right so if you understand that maybe there's something else, it's not all in your head, society doesn't make it easy, you're constantly fed images of what you need to look like, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are. You, like, I notice this a lot in my patients, you know, in their early 20s, you know, in terms of the cosmetic stuff, procedures that are going on, like, you know, I want to say maybe 20 or 30 years ago, it was something reserved as a sort of anti-aging tool. And now it's, everybody is like, I'm not happy with how I look. And so I have access. And while there's nothing wrong with that, for a lot of people, and also I think because we're doing sort of more remote work where we see ourselves all day long on Zoom, you know, yes, plastic yes. surgeons will tell you that the number of procedures have gone up. So it's very interesting in telling that no matter how youthful and supple and beautiful you normally are, nobody is satisfied. And there is a whole industry that is profiting from that. So you have to have awareness that there are other systems that are that are going on that are making you feel this way. And then to beef up your, your internal self sense of self-worth, to be able to contend with it. And it's really hard. It's like if you're getting images everywhere you go, yeah. you have to be aware of that, that yeah. you're being fed and you're fighting a battle every single day, no matter how old you are. You know, like I, I want to say that maybe there's some some segment of the population that is like social media was never a thing for us. You know, I'm not on technology, doesn't affect me. But for most everybody else, it does. It does, you, you know, it does affect you. So how pride differs. And I was big on this from self-esteem. So I define pride as self-compassion, and that's an intrinsic sense of self-worth that is based on, I am human, I deserve love. That's it. It is a fact. It is is as simple as your existence. On the other hand, self-esteem is based on how you do in the world, how you accomplish what what, what you did, what you didn't achieve. And if you don't do well on a test, if you don't get a promotion, If your career is not succeeding, if you didn't meet the societal milestones, you end up feeling your self-esteem is really low. So I don't love that. I don't want to give my sense of my self-esteem or sense of self-worth to anyone to decide. And so that's why I realized I need something even more basic, not contingent upon anything in the outside world. And I started seeing this with my patients. Self-compassion and the research done by Kristen Neff really spoke to me because it has these three components to it. It first says mindful observation of what you're experiencing. So it brings in a little bit of that emotional processing, like being aware of what your thoughts are. And then having acceptance around those thoughts. And something that I always say to my patients, think of your thoughts as luggage on an airport baggage carousel. You would look at other people's luggage, but you're not taking it home. You're aware of it. You're observing it. You're noticing it. You're paying attention. Maybe you're even making remarks about how silly some of the baggage looks how damaged, how beautiful, how luxurious, whatever the thoughts are, you're not taking you're not taking them home. Creating space and distance from the thoughts and then accepting them. So I feel like crap right now because I've gained five pounds. This really sucks. I'm just making that up. Or I didn't get this promotion that I've been trying for a year. Like this, this is really crappy. And then the common humanity part, which is I'm not alone. Other people have gained weight, Other fill in the blank. Other people have not gotten the promotion at their job. Other people have failed in this respect. Am I the only one? Because that's what shame does, is shame has you believe that you're alone and it isolates you because you don't ask help. You think you're so rotten to the core. I mean, that's an extreme. Some people feel like they're so rotten to their core. And when it gets to that point, then I say you have to seek professional help, even if it's just one session, because one session can do wonders. If you need more, absolutely, that's something you talk about. But therapy had been so beneficial and so eye-opening for me in my own journey as a person, as a professional, to help me relate to my patients better. 
Um, and I and I'm a big believer in it. You know, people say, "Oh, well, you're a psychiatrist; you can write prescription for meds." That, that's kind of the last thing I do when I meet somebody. It's not the first, and and it has its role. It can be very beneficial, but it, I look at it just as one piece of a comprehensive treatment plan. But this journey of self discovery is a must. Is a must for everybody, and self compassion is a must. And there's so much science behind it. You know, when we look at mothers or parents that did a self-compassion exercise. It doesn't take long, it could be 15 minutes. Th these are parents who had children with disabilities or other hardships and challenges, and they're in an extreme caregiving role, and they felt less stressed as a result of doing these self-compassion exercises just for a few weeks. Students who filled math exams and they did self-compassion exercise ended up beating the kids that were in the control. Not only did they do better, but they, they beat the control, and that's because you don't perseverate. You don't ruminate. You don't say, beat yourself up. You're like, you know what? It happened. I feel like crap. I'm not alone. Other people go through this. Now what? So self-compassion and a healthy sense of pride gives you a path forward. And that's the practical part of the optimism is, now what? And helps you move and gives you a real plan and forces you to put a plan in place. I love that. And just building on that mindful observation, what are just, you know, for some action items for our listeners, what are some ways that we can create distance? So you mentioned these self compassion exercises. Are these like sentence stem completions? Like what, what is an example of a self compassion exercise that someone who's listening is like, yeah, I, I probably need some of this. Like what are some of the things that someone might invoke or, or start doing in their own lives? Yeah. So the first thing I would say, like, Again, going to the journaling because I can't talk about it enough. It sounds so maybe silly or juvenile or woo-woo, but there are so much studies behind the, the benefit of writing down on paper what you're going through. It f decreases the number of colds and infections people have per year. It can um, expedite wound healing after like a biopsy or a surgery. And so there's real science behind it. And this can be a self-compassion exercise where you say to yourself, okay, you write the situation down, you know, I failed. You know, I tried and I failed. If you tried, if you didn't try, you just write that you failed. Maybe you failed because you didn't try. So that's fine too. Maybe you're beating yourself up because you didn't have enough time to prepare. So write that down. You know, I, I missed a deadline because of a de I missed an opportunity. I couldn't get there. Let's say there was this a really amazing conference or networking event that you didn't get to sign up on time because you're too busy, you procrastinated and it was a once in a lifetime and you were going to meet the most amazing superstar idol of yours. And you're like, that could have been a game changer for me. I could have networked. I could have met some really amazing people. And you might beat yourself up. And maybe you're saying to yourself, you're going down a, a spiral. I'm not responsible. I'm, I procrastinate. I put things off. As a result of putting things off, I end up missing amazing opportunities. Why can't I get my act together? I'm just a mess. My life is a mess. My life is a disaster. I'm just never going to make it. And so writing down this kind of like downward spiral and these negative thoughts and then asking yourself, then you take a step back, write down all the negative thoughts. I'm a loser. I hate myself. And then what are the emotions? This is like a thought log. What are the emotions that go along with it? So the situation is we've picked, I didn't sign up for an event, important event on time that could have been game changing. The thoughts are, I'm a loser. I procrastinate. I can't do anything right. I'm never going to succeed. And then the emotions are, I feel anxious. My heart's racing. I feel rejected. I feel like a loser or you know, sort of anxious and sad. And then challenging those thoughts. So you notice you use the word never, I'm never gonna succeed. That's called all or nothing thinking. So I have a list in that book of cognitive distortions. You're jumping to conclusions. Nothing will ever work out for me. You're fortune telling, you're discounting the positives. That's a big one. A lot of people in the midst of self-hate and self-loathing will completely discount. You know what? Yeah, I missed this event, but guess what? I go to every other event. I've been going to the same event five times in a row. This was the first time. So we end up just focusing on one negative aspect of the experience and forget of all the positive things that we have done. We discount them and we forget that we've done a lot of great stuff in our life. So the, dis the challenging of the distortions is a big part of it. What would you tell a friend? We're often more compassionate with our friends. How am I going to feel about this five years from now? You know what? Missing one conference, one year, one time it's not going to change. So it, you could literally feel it because everyone has a different situation and scenario that makes them catastrophize and think that they're a loser. Identifying the emotions and then saying the common humanity, am I the only one who's never done this? Uh, other people mess up too. And for sometimes, like what, what we call a thought log, for some people, it's not going to work. And for them, I say do something called progressive muscle relaxation, which is just getting out of your head. Sometimes someone's like, 
thank you, you're giving me all these great cognitive tools. It's called cognitive restructuring, but they're like, right now I'm too deep in it. So I'm like, you know what, don't even bother, come back to it later. And so, you know, progressive muscle relaxation, which is closing your eyes and clenching and releasing muscle group by muscle group. You know, like, you know I think there's like 14 or 16 main muscle groups like your eyes and your shoulders and your fists, your quads, hamstrings, toes, and like 15 minutes or 20 minutes a day. And this is thought to invoke the relaxation response or the parasympathetic nervous system. For me, it's taking a hot bath. That's something I need every day, like before going to bed. And I feel literally like trouble's melting away. You know, we know that the role of hot water, like when women are in labor or birthing and pain. And there's something to be said that psychic pain gets read in the same part of the brain, thalamus, as physical pain, you know, when we get rejected. So there is something, you know, giving yourself physical comfort, soothing, tea, a warm blanket, like it's not gonna change your life, but these little warm, fuzzy moments that make you feel safe. For some people, it might be a weighted blanket, you know, how to feel safe within your body. For some people, it's taking a nap. I had a patient who was like, I get really dark thoughts at night, I'm a, I live alone, I'm sad, you know, I may call a friend, but then I, I just said to her, listen, what is the utility of staying up for four hours and crying and it's going to take you to a dark place? And then for her going to bed at 8 p.m. those evenings helped. It's short-circuited. So you're not always going to be able to talk yourself out. So you're going to have a need to have a bunch of techniques to short-circuit the negative thinking. But the restructuring in the long run is going to help you the, the most. Being able to reframe through the cognitive challenges, the cognitive strategies, reframe the way you look at things. So I used to be someone who, you know, would beat myself up. And now, not that I don't, it's just a lot less frequent because it's now I've learned to immediately go to what are your distortions? What are you doing in the situation? How can I think of this another way? So it just brings, it makes it a little bit lighter. It doesn't make it go away completely. And I think it's, it's also helpful to understand that we're probably neurologically wired to focus on the negative. So you could go to yeah. five conferences out of six and you'll focus on the one that you didn't go to and beat yourself up about it because that may have conferred in, you know, generations past to our ancestors, our foremothers and forefathers, you know, safety, right? Safety in the tribe or like identifying any type of threat would be a threat literally to potentially your survival. The other thing I, I, I like about the cognitive the thought log that you were describing and like all the like all the things that maybe prevented you from going to the conference. I think it's also important and I'm sure that you well, I'll, I'll just present this and you can tell me what, what you think is to also identify the obstacles and not as an excuse like maybe this year I couldn't get to the conference because I couldn't find childcare or childcare is too expensive and we're just not in the position this year to, you know, take the flight and the childcare and you know, or what you know, I'm just making up examples here. So what you know, whatever the obstacles might have been, I think that's important. And I identifying. And yes, I appreciate so much your last sentence, which was, you know, I, it's not that I don't beat myself up anymore, but it's just that I have a bit more of a balanced, it's almost like you've developed, or maybe you've just given more time to the opposing voice. So there's that voice that yeah. tells you that you are terrible and you're worthless and you are just a loser for not getting to this conference. And then there's another voice that's like, Hey, but it's also really expensive and it's time away from my kids. And it's, you know, an air airports and flights and disrupted circadian rhythms and all the other things. So you've, you've given a voice to the equal and opposing thought, which I think so many of us tend to like, it's already there, but we don't shine a light on it. We don't actually give it any, any attention. Exactly. And Stephanie, that's so, I'm so glad you said that because I, I think that it's really important and not just with the book talks to you about boosting optimism, but it also talks that we, in, in, like you said, equal and opposing force of pessimism needs to be quieted down. And we found like studies have shown that it's not enough for someone to do optimism interventions or exercises. They also have to, at the same time, lower the pessimism. And that's what you're doing. Is that what you're saying? That yes, we're boosting the positive, but give that more voice that you have. Yeah, wonderful.